Hi, everybody. So I'm just going to introduce the last speaker of our day. So here to speak about the evolving publishing landscape as we witness the possible end of broadcast media is Robert Wheaton, Chief Operating Officer of Penguin Random House Canada. Robert's flagship projects at PRHC include Hazlitt, an online magazine which has received eight National Magazine Award gold medals since its launch in 2012, and Penguin Shop, which opened in summer 2016. He's also a former web developer and a published writer. From 2005 to 2011, Robert worked at Indigo Books and Music, including as Director of Inventory Management. Please welcome to the stage, Robert Wheaton. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, um, this talk is a little bit strange. I, um, I think I last spoke here four or five years ago, and a few people have told me this week that the, the thing that resonated with them is I, I uh, had an instruction to, to hire nerds. Um, and um, what's happened in, in the meantime is, at, at that point, I was, I was managing the sort of the digital sales, digital strategy um, team. And for the last year or so, um, I've, been, I've been managing a kick-ass sales and marketing and publicity team. And, and I've learned a lot and, and thought a lot uh, and tried to be very thoughtful about the industry. And so I think some of that is reflected here. And I've spent most of the day trying to understand how what I have to talk about possibly correlates to an envelope, a plug, and what I think is a credit card. <laughs> I don't really think this is my brand. And if this represents email, it certainly is not um, my brand. Um, so I, just before I start, uh, I should mention a, a trigger warning for a, a brief discussion around uh, online harassment, which is around the sort of 25, 30 minute mark. Uh, when I start talking about chaos, that's when it is. Um, and uh, I kind of took the liberty of, of um, going with a bit of a the thematic title for what follows. Um, and there's a few Penguin Random House people here today, so those who work with me will know that at least three of these are usually in the daily mix. Um, I think we probably all in this industry have friends who are only casually interested in, in books or in the industry, and will ask, why we work in the industry. And often the last thing they've heard about the industry is books are dying and isn't all of that going away and isn't Amazon destroying your business and do you need a publisher anymore? Isn't publishing just a platform tool? Isn't just a publish and you can just hit the publish button? Um, and we don't always help our case. Uh, but today I want to talk about um, two uh, inventions of the publishing industry. Uh, and I think I'm going to make an argument that every one uh, of those friends that we talked to is wrong. Um, and I'm going to make an argument that publishing has actually uh, incubated a digital first business model. And our task ahead of us for the next four or five years is to figure out how we can best extract that and strengthen it. And, and the work's well underway. I think it's going to get harder. So two inventions. The first one is our business model. Um, and I'll talk about what it is and how we can, how we can strengthen it um, and how we need to start thinking carefully about responsibility uh, because things are going to start to get really complicated. And the second one I will tell you about halfway through. Um, so let's start with publishing and kind of where it's at. So there is a pretty standard narrative around this end of broadcast media idea and it's a thing that we're all living through and the story is usually told using a bunch of incredibly boring charts but really, it would be possible to tell a story by saying, here's a television show that's not funded by uh, advertising. And you can watch it when, wherever and whenever you want. And here are some radio shows that you can listen to wherever and whenever you want. And they're produced by people and companies that aren't radio broadcast networks. Uh, and here are some poets who sell a lot more books than poets usually do uh, because they're out there developing their own audiences. And I think everyone is, is pretty familiar with these kinds of dynamics. However, I found the boring charts, so here they come anyway. Uh, what follows is, is characterized, I think, by three kind of interrelated uh, conditions, one of them involving uh, traditional media, one of them traditional retail, and one of them how audiences are finding things um, that they're interested in. And 
Here, we've all seen this. This is the poster child of the failed physical to digital revenue transition. It's obviously the music industry. Only recently, some gains, they're like nice lilac colors at the end there are streaming, bringing people back from the um, piracy and the unlicensed streaming. Tiny resurgence in vinyl is a very pale green at the bottom. And we've all seen this chart and, you know, world well, music industry, et cetera, et cetera. Never, ever let them get away with telling this story without reminding them that they were surfing off 20 years of reselling the same product to the same audience that already bought it years ago. Here's the standard chart of the decline in newspaper advertising. We've all seen this. And it's transitioned to digital platforms, almost entirely Google and Facebook. Um, there's Canadian data as well. It's just as scary. So is the circulation data. It's scary for magazines as well. Here's a blank slide because I wanted to graph out the frequency of the term book review in Canadian newspapers over the last 10 years. But Google closed down their media search service in 2011. Here's what's happening to book discovery. In 2015, physical bookstore discovery remained number one uh, as a source of consumer, what's the next book you're going to read, at 45%. But you add up all the online ones together, and you get to 50%. Uh, this, of course, is already out of date. Noah talked this morning. Thanks, Noah. Um, and I think we all know the, the narrative behind the declining number of chapters in Indigo stores and the gr growth of non-book categories in their shelf and floor space. So there's this kind of weakening of traditional outlets, which privileged entities that had kind of distribution chokeholds uh, over these digital ways of, of consumers getting content uh, with um, ex the, these new opportunities of extremely low marginal distribution costs. In other words, uh, it doesn't cost any of these companies very much, if anything, to serve an additional consumer. And that's very, very different from a radio broadcaster that has to build extra antenna. So um, alongside this, audiences are kind of assembling themselves in online communities where self-identification is possible. And so the traditional kind of instruments of shaping the market are weaker than ever. Sounds bad for a traditional media model. And yet, here we stand, slash sit, slash slumber. Noah gave us an overview of the state of the market at the, uh, at the start of the day. The, the industry remains intact. Books are still being published. The books are still being sold. Books are still being read. This is variously attributed to stubbornness, millennials, billionaire oligarchs, among other things, the decline of the celebrity memoir genre, or it's because reading a paper book is what you do when you're threatened by machines. I'd like to make a conceptual argument that publishing is actually incubated in secret, a business model that's perfectly suited to this emerging dynamic. Um, and this is the thing we've all seen. It's the sales curve. It's this idea of a small number of bestsellers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. So this is the, uh, the Chris Anderson style sales curve with, um, we'll come to this in a second. So you have your best sellers stacked up on the left. These are the titles that sell uh, huge amounts and then narrowing down to this long tail. And the Chris Anderson thesis was, um, this is where a small audience will find niche products that are perfect for them. Why don't you just make more bestsellers is of course how the joke goes. And everyone thinks this is our business model, this thing, just poorly executed. You make a bunch of books based on partial information. Sometimes you're an idiot, oops. And somehow you make money. You should use data to make better decisions. And then you should give somebody else some money. Um, and this actually is not our business model. This is what our business model is. Thank you to Paul for helping with this data. Um, what this shows is the relationship between initial inventory distribution and first year sales. So it's the same alignment of titles. The titles that sold the most were on the left and the titles that sold the least are on the right. But the height of each data point is the extent to which they oversold the initial inventory investment. So this actually sort of demonstrates our management of risk. So here we have some best-selling titles with these huge spikes on the left, 
That's because there was a fairly modest amount of inventory that initially went out in the marketplace. And yet, uh, over the first year, they sold a significantly higher amount. In other words, we took a chance on something and it blew expectations out of the water. Now, this isn't a perfect measure here because that risk in inventory is many steps of checking in. We acquire the book, then we do a whole bunch of other things, and then after talking to retailers and some pre-release marketing and things like that, the retailer chooses how much to buy. So there's already been a few kind of gate checks on that initial assessment of risks that the publisher took when they acquired the book. Um, I could have shown it relative to advances, but our CFO is on the board of directors for BookNet, and I, I kind of felt like enjoying the wine and cheese afterwards. So I kind of compromised a little bit. I realize there's no y-axis, it's kind of like an Amazon slide. Um, <laughs> but I think it does a good illustration of um, some reasonable kind of risk management, especially in the middle where there's a pretty um, clear and consistent sell-through on inventory invested. Um, but the, there's enough surprises on the left to offset, offset the losses that are over on the right. And that essentially is what our business model is. It's about deliberate risk management. A business model is this incredible mix, it's sort of matrix of um, incentives, of interacting of parties with different interests. There's some fear in there. There's some sunken cost fallacies, but it works. If overall the kind of the balance of the portfolio is net positive, there's enough happy surprises to outsell the unhappy disappointments, uh, then it works. It allows authors to get paid in advance. This rewards and allows authors to write the books. It also, and I say this as a published writer, uh, it terrifies you into finishing the thing. Um, and then finally, because it involves working with others in the, in the value chain, you're working with agents and printers and retailers and wholesalers and librarians, um, publishers are constantly checking in on the potential estimation of their investment. But the fact that they've already paid for it prevents them from getting scared and not doing anything to try and chase down the readership. And we have an incredible amount of processes to check in. So we make the initial investment, but there's all kinds of steps on that initial investment to see whether the enthusiasm for the book is widely shared. And these are all the traditional publishing steps. Actually, I probably missed a few. These are many of the traditional publishing steps. If you went back 10 years, it would look pretty much the same, except you could charge for excerpts. I think the story of our industry over the last few years is how many net new indicators there are that we can now use to kind of gate check our thoughts on that risk management. And some of the old ones are now newly measurable. And I think this is at the heart of the change within our industry and the skills uh, mix that's needed within, within our industry. We haven't stopped doing the things that we did before, but we need a different set of skills and processes and time to better serve our business model by doing these things or doing these things in different ways. With all that said, if we did no refinement whatsoever, there will still be books that we publish for audiences that we don't know yet, and they'll surprise us. Uh, because sometimes it's actually the experience of reading the book that helps create the audience. But sometimes the audience has moved on. Uh, and at the end of the day, successfully managing our business as a portfolio of risk means that at some point, we will publish too many books. So, okay. That's nice. Is that actually important? Um, your answer to this is going to depend a little bit on whether you think ideas are important to sort of align and interpret events, to understand our world, to use the tools of narrative and inquiry to sort of situate ourselves, to su suggest action. For the philosophy students in the room, and this is a publishing conference, so I know there's some philosophy students in the room. Um, this is a, so I know this is a pretty safe bet. This is the concept that what society determines to be truth is actually a negotiated outcome based upon what's useful. In other words, what society needs at any given time. So you really need more and you need more diverse ideas coming into the mix all the time. For the product folks in the room, here's former IDEO partner Peter Coughlin. If you want better solutions for the problems of the world, then you should push a lot of ideas out. And there are certainly problems in need of solutions. 
uh, with many more to come, and I'll come back to this in a second. Um, but let's come back to this, and I had a bunch of other slides here, but then Noah just said this this morning, so he saved you all some, some more charts. Here's a chart that I like to scare uh, everyone with um, every few years. Um, it's from a study called Experimental Study of Inequality and Unpredictability, Unpredictability in an Artificial Cultural Market. Good leisure reading. Basically, they examined what happens. You have a set of cultural goods. They use songs, in this case, um, of equal quality. And quality, they sort of tested this with a separate study to say, let's get some songs that everybody likes as much as all the other songs. Um, and then all they did, they just made these songs available for download. And to one group, they just tracked which songs were downloaded with the assumption that some songs would become more popular than others. Um, and then with another group, all they did was just rank the songs that were being downloaded the most. So they introduced one social signal. So theoretically, this study says what happens if you remove all the intermediaries, all retailers, uh, all media uh, between artists, musicians, writers, and their audiences, and see what happens. And what happens is two things. First of all, the hits become bigger. So that inequality dramatically increases. And the other thing is, every time they ran the study, it was a different set of songs that came out on top. So they increased inequality and unpredictability simply by showing the, the ranked uh, most downloaded songs. So I was, I was struck by a phrase that uh, Noah had this morning, this erratic demand is more and more the norm in our business. And if you kind of think back over the last few years, you can imagine between Harry Potter and Twilight and Stieg Larsson and Fifty Shades of Grey um, and coloring books, we have had these phenomena of unpredictable um, trends, phenomenon that audiences have discovered and then um, disseminated amongst themselves to the extent that it it drives the market in a way that nobody could have predicted. And I think that that emerging trend where audiences are, are setting demand more, in many parts enabled by some of the things that Nathan just talked about, this business model is set up and stress tested to respond to those unknowns in audience behavior, in my view, perfectly for the situation. So I think the work ahead of us is, how do we strengthen that match? And not to spoil anything here, but I think you probably knew where this was going. We've been talking about our business model, uh, which I mentioned was one of the industry's two great inventions. So I'll get to the second one. It's not the codex, which certainly predates publishing. I'm not thinking about copyright, which is a pretty good invention, but if we start that, then we're gonna be here for hours talking about watermelons. Uh, and it's not the book trailer. Of course, I'm talking about the hindsight refraction device, also known as the book cover. Hindsight refraction device aggregates all potential reasons for why a book did not perform as expected, and then it ascribes them retroactively to the design of the cover. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about the book cover itself as a technology, because it's enjoying this kind of stunning resurgence. Book retail in major markets has shifted dramatically to online. Uh, other major retailers are more and more taking very small inventory investments, shelf buys, um, and it means that a book's cover now, increasingly where it has to catch attention first, is online, where it's gonna be rendered at a significantly smaller size. Hence, we get covers that are starting to look like this, highly colorful, highly graphical. Some of this is obviously aesthetics, may have something to do with vinyl, might have something to do with performative hipsters, or performative millennials, or teens, or really anyone looking to display their taste. But there are blogs which cover book design, book designers selling prints based on their work, series redesign has become potential publicity hook, we have animated book covers, uh, there are Instagram design accounts about book covers, there is Book Face Friday and ice cream books, if anyone doesn't know what ice cream book says, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, there are designers posting rejects of iconic book covers. This in including at least one total heartbreaker, since I think this book is significantly delayed. Is anyone from Simon in the room? 
Maybe, can we talk afterwards? Maybe. Uh, but my point is that actually we have these incredible opportunities in our processes with the materials that our processes throw off to actually get in touch with and learn from consumers. So our job, I think, in the next few years is to radically increase the number of these risk check-ins in our processes, mostly with consumers. We used to manage the unknowns and risk in our business model with process and with inventory, and it stacked all of this risk in inventory, which is really expensive, and effectively shut out audiences that that capital investment, one of the factors that prevented us from speaking to those audiences is because we had all of this inventory stacked up. Now we have the opportunity, and because of the trends we, we spoke about, we really have no choice but to manage this risk by information and sophistication. That means, I think, going beyond POS and inventory data and looking at demand signals wherever we can get our fingers on them. So Goodreads ratings and Kobo ratings, Indigo and Amazon reviews, Instagram likes, library holds and circulation. I think it also means being very open-minded about different kinds of signals from consumers. And it's often the sort of stray and unlikely data points that can show you surprising emerging behaviors before you'd otherwise know about them. So local trends, uh, temporal trends. I'd also argue there's a pretty dramatic need for, the in, for an industry-wide protocol on data sharing that is gonna get us beyond POS and inventory. Those have been game changers, but mostly they're oriented around supply chain savings. I think we, we need a set of standards and definitions around new generation of data points that are oriented around consumer demand and some protocols on how to share them so collectively we're serving audiences better. On the path of using data to progress as an industry from confusion to enlightenment, right now, the data resources that we have at our disposal are spending too much time on this sort of above the line work for data management. So scraping, cleaning, warehousing, aggregating, and really not enough time synthesizing, dashboarding, and communicating. We're spending way too much time up here and less time actually working with the data and becoming better informed. So I think everyone in this business needs to get their head around the fact. We need to share data more willingly to figure this out and engage in a process to communicate about what data shows us more effectively. And this isn't just about massive data sources, it's about inclination. How do we interrogate decisions with information? We have a lot of tools that already make this pretty easy. Wouldn't it be nice to know before we publish a book what kind of response the book cover might have. It'd be great to test book covers or design treatments or ads. Let's face it, it's not like this industry lacks for opportunities to say, I told you so. And, and the truth is we can. We can put two different treatments of an ad or a cover on Facebook and monitor the result or many, many other techniques. My point is that we have many opportunities to learn from our consumers. One of them, everyone should have their own sales channel in this, in this industry. It can be really small, it can be online. Online's great because you can monitor the entire funnel. You can try different things that maybe your retailers aren't willing to try. Um, a store, if you can make it work, is obviously fantastic. You probably won't compete on price. Really, you want to be um, focusing on customer service. It's the book industry, so some idiosyncrasy in customer service is permitted. And, but it's the basics of those customer services that are gonna teach you a lot about your consumers. You should publish online. And I don't mean put the entire book online. Rather, what are the pieces of content that you can repurpose and adapt and excerpt? And the point is to develop audience loyalty from which you can learn not to measure click-throughs on book covers, though you should do that too, but to actually learn about consumers and how they find their way there and how they behave. And you don't need to have an award-winning magazine. Sorry, no tech forum presentation without mentioning Hazlitt. Basically, your content marketing is valuable consumer research assets. So all of these risk check-ins that respond to data, and we're starting as an industry to set up new roles in building this out, some hybrid roles between um, salespeople and analysts and marketers and, and analysts. And it's, it's important, I think, not to let go of the fact that using information like standing on the right in an escalator is actually everyone's responsibility, not just those with designated roles. I think it's about a set of attitudes with which we need to approach the next generation of data in this industry. 
Speaking of attitudes, I want to tell a very brief parable, which I think many here might find resonant, and I think is at the heart of the kind of exercise that we need to spend the next few years conducting. I think it's a topic of generational importance to our industry and sheds light on a lot of the critical issues that are facing us. A bildungsroman, if you like, for the age of digital change involving hope and despair and the realization that our tools disappoint us and the forces of inertia and entropy overcome even the best intentions of the passionate and the dedicated. And I'm talking, of course, about people who cannot or will not use content management systems. Let's say you have a website that needs some content edited. It's nice and easy, right? You just log in and make those edits. Well, maybe a manager would like to review the changes before you make them. So you print out your edits and deliver them to your manager, who will make her edits, and then scan them, and email them to you, and then you will alt-tab the hell out of that to get them online. And then you're done, right? Well, someone has to shred the papers, and then, of course, you have to go on LinkedIn again. This is actually, I see some people <laughs> making faces and some people uh, laughing sympathetically. This is actually a true example. It's not from the book publishing industry, because I didn't want to be mean, um, but it's a company that's one degree of separation away. I'll put it like that. I think this kind of dynamic is incredibly, incredibly common in uh, media cultural industries right now. To all those who say, well, at least you have a CMS, I think our industry is full of these kinds of essentially data entry processes. Much of our work is still assigned to process rather than aligned to our business model. There's a lot of pulling information out of systems and stuffing information back into systems. And we need to, I think, move to a model that inspects every aspect of our workflow and our process and says, does this really add value? Like, does the person sitting in the chair doing this they could contribute much more to this than just shifting these units of information around. Does this process help us assess and build upon risk? Now, what does it look like if you put a digital-first workflow in situations like this? So it not only has a learning curve that's both technical and conceptual, but I actually think there's something bigger here. It, it's almost like a kind of vertigo because these kinds of, of processes, they sort of blur the lines between capability and autonomy and ownership and responsibility and authority and technology. There's basically no safety net. And I think, to turn this back to books, I think that's a question of two distinct mental models that are at work in the industry. One of them says, is, the work, is your work the book? The book is a physical product that's the linear and concrete outcome of all the stuff you happen to have to do that presumably was handed down to you by the person that did your job before. Or is the book somewhere in the middle of this cloud of information management responsibilities that's actually impossible to separate it out from? So if you're responsible for the book, you're sort of responsible in some way for all aspects of its representation. And these are, I think these two models are two separate languages at work here. And if you flip it around and look at it in the reverse, I think um, it's how people in the industry without a data background but a lot of experience or inclination think about instinct. Uh, and they're right. And I want to be clear that this is not generational because uh, I've worked with plenty of, of young people who are unacceptably incompetent about how to use computers and many older people who are thrilled that our industry tools are now beginning to move past or beginning to, to get to how do I attempt to solve this problem rather than how do I stuff my work into a system uh, in exactly the prescribed sequence. But I think what happens when you bring technology to bear is it's a bit like when someone writes some VBA to automate the creation of a PowerPoint deck that otherwise eats 25 hours of a sales coordinator's time each week. It's not a situation that everyone really has the right mental model to understand. So it feels like magic. Uh, thank you, Arthmika, for this. Apparently, Cecilia's figured out a faster way to do it. Um, I think it's important that actually we talk about magic because magic has a focus on enchantment. It's an open system, if potentially sometimes elitist. Unlike sorcery, which has authoritarian figures and exclusive centralized power structures. <laughs> but it's interesting that we're talking about wizards in both cases because I think it's the wizardry model 
Honestly, I gotta say, this is the most meta Google image search result that I've <laughs> ever seen. Uh, I think it's this model that has got us into this trouble in the first place. It looks like you're trying to do this unit of work. You should do it this way. No, really this way. I showed you this already. Why didn't you listen? The system doesn't work that way. And so getting away from this into a culture of openness, of friendly tools, of actual practice and transparency, working with scripting languages, I think, so people can see time being solved and problems being addressed. I think we should use open, off-the-shelf software, the kind of software that people are more likely to have um, their siblings or their kids or their families using, so people with different backgrounds can seamlessly enter the company without the, the learning curve of proprietary software. The purpose of all of this is we want a, great, a greater range of ideas to further our reach to consumers. But that's gonna mean greater humility and empathy and openness among the industry and with our, with our colleagues. If we want opinions and ideas that mirror our audience's diversity, then the trade-off for that is time because consensus and groupthink are faster, but our audiences don't have consensus, which is sort of the point of our business model. And we should stop wasting our time on stuff like this. So much of this goes hand in hand with a mental model of, of what we do and of work in general. Um, and we talk a lot in this industry about what great content we have, and we do, but it's boxed inside a finished book, and we're the ones boxing it. I think becoming a little bit more flexible and adaptable with excerpts and cover images and alternative cover images and before and after edits and interviews with, with editors, all these things can become assets to inform us with our audiences. Um, and I think this is overall getting to a sense of practice rather than process. So by definition, executing our business model involves allowing the books to discover their audiences not perfectly executing the predictable steps required to bring to market, but allowing ourselves to be surprised. And knowing that as those audiences are always changing, the work is never over. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about something else too, just before I close, um, because all of those things are not enough. Some of the things I've suggested I think are actually at odds with one another and taken to an extreme, I think they're gonna risk what makes our business model work because they could come at a high risk to the fundamentals, such as privacy, that also threatens the breadth of representation with which we can reach audiences. If, if we agree that ideas are important and that a range of voices and opinions serves a positive social and political good to broaden the range of human experience and human empathy, then we need to be prepared for the fact that those ideas have opponents, that orthod orthodoxies provoke dissent and dissent provokes reaction. And many who are privileged in this outgoing mainstream media model don't respond positively when that privilege is even identified, even identified, let alone challenged. We have a sort of standard theory of censorship that understands state and sovereign action, laws and prosecution, uh, whether it's a theocracy or an autocracy or a democracy. It's a pretty good reading list, actually. Um, and our experience of extra-legal suppression understands organized violence. But all of these things, state suppression, localized and distributed censorship, and mob violence, they all have online equivalents. Government censorship increasingly targets writers online. Penn estimates that nearly 50% of imprisoned writers are persecuted for their work online. Uh, this is Ethiopia's Zone 9 bloggers, who were arrested in 2014 and held for over a year on charges that included attending digital security training. In Malaysia, the cartoonist Zuna was again arrested at the end of last year, and the online pl platform that sells his books was forced to release the details of the people who purchased them. Uh, the Sony Dana hack showed us the risks of government-sponsored corporate hacks and these risks certainly apply to companies whose data contains author and reader data. If you haven't read about the Sony hack, you should. It's awful, but sort of worse, it's funny. And I think a boring hack without the backbiting and the trashing of talent and the corporate infighting 
would have better kept the focus front and center on how a media, modern media company was completely disabled and 47,000 people had their personal information disclosed. And things like this will happen in the publishing industry. Independent publishers don't have the resources for large security teams. Multinationals have systems that are too broadly distributed. One territory or another is gonna be a backdoor for other territories. One territory will publish a, a book that's controversial in its nature and expose its publisher to a, a DDoS attack or a core data hack. And actually these things are already starting to happen. So we should all make sure we get out of the habit of looking at files, file names like passwords.txt and get used to the idea of carrying around something like this and think hard about the data that we have. How did we get it? Was it gathered with informed consent and opt-out procedures? Is it warehoused in a jurisdiction that adequately protects consumer rights that are appropriate to our values as an industry? We need to think about how we treat it. Do we store this data in secure systems? But then do we export pieces of it and leave them on network or desktop databases or in Excel files? In my opinion, the bas basics of encryption should be taught in publishing school. That's the importance of this to our industry. Now, we, we already have the equivalent of the crowdsourced harassment. Most of the bullying controversy that's surfaced over the years on, on sites like Goodreads is actually focused on the behavior of authors and publicists, demanding that reviewers rescind low re reviews. But last September, author Laura Silverman's YA novel, Girl Out of Water, which actually, it isn't out until May, so this was long in advance of reading copies going out, was beset by a sea of one-star reviews on Goodreads after her criticism of Donald Trump. Uh, author A.C. Thomas was subjected to a campaign of abuse after she created the hashtag, I stand for diversity. Uh, and she had to temporarily uh, shut down her Twitter account. Many of you know the Canadian writer Sachi Cole, who had a similar experience last year. This is Kurt Eichenwald, who's an author and a journalist who's written extensively in opposition to Donald Trump. Last December, Eichenwald, who's epileptic, was sent an animated strobe-like gif with the message, you deserve a seizure for your posts. So I think it's in Gamergate that we see the dynamics that truly imperil our business model. As our business model shifts towards more data-driven demand patterns, in these dynamics, reader behavior actually increases the danger for authors. How should we as an industry protect writers who can be identified based on their public information? And how do we publish into topics when audiences can be singled out and pushed underground because of their self-identification on a topic or on a range of books? So I'm actually, I'd like to close on a note of hope because I think there's opportunities to address some of these challenges. So I'd like to lay down kind of three challenges for the industry that I think we should undertake in the service of authors and in support of readers who choose to share stories and ideas with one another. Alongside increasing data literacy in our industry, we need a program of ethics and data management to safeguard consumers and audiences and writers and to protect the risk taking that's at the heart of our business model. A few weeks ago, many of you probably saw this, a designer named Georgia Lupi, she posted a manifesto on data humanism, and it spoke to the illusion of simplicity uh, that's at the heart of the recent kind of data visualization trend. And she suggests a practice which is more humane, which defers to complexity, incompleteness, to nuance, to limitations, to the challenges of, ident of individual identity. And I think that a similar deference to, to the individual has to inform our data practices, starting with privacy. I think we should avoid working with partners whose online experiences generate a da data trail that could be used to track consumers, and our own online endeavors shouldn't throw off a data trail. We aren't advertisers, and it's not a profit center for us, but this is an extremely hard challenge because I basically just described how most of online advertising works. I think we need an ethical gate check in addition to the operational ones that we already have in place when we're sharing metadata with partners. If we're providing data to an organization that's going to build consumer networks on top of it, how committed are they to protecting the identities of those consumers? What are their data practices? Where do they store data? How would they qualify and limit access to an open API? How will they prevent identifying and clustering of consumers? 
As we push for increased data sharing in the industry, we should be insisting that our partners and us obscure and protect that consumer data. And there's actually a discipline, uh, data pseudonymization, that's related specifically to this. We should be governed by internal codes of conduct and industry standards that are more severe than those within the government privacy laws so that we're not capturing and storing and tempted to use data in ways that would comp compromise readers or imperil writers. And we should celebrate the benefits of an intermediated value chain in which there are lots of bookstores and lots of online retailers uh, in which no one actor owns all the pieces. And competitors exist among which consumers and suppliers can mix up their activity so that consumers can conduct their reading lives in separate places and in ways that are shielded from one another. In this context, by the way, supporting independent booksellers isn't just good customer service. It's a moral, moral and ethical responsibility in our industry. And so when new ones open, we should celebrate. In other words, we have a social and ethical obligation uh, that's aligned with strengthening our business model. Uh, and I think this uh, statement, so often a slight, actually constitutes a manifesto for a responsible, moral, ethical, and fully adapted publishing business fully digitally adapted publishing business, business with a crucial social and political role in the future. And finally, um, in the area of data responsibility, we need all voices to be heard, not just the data, cap data capable among us. We should be profoundly empathetic to those who don't have at their disposal the skills to pull tens of thousands of lines of data into a pivot table, because it's going to take time, and it isn't a measure of anyone's commitment just as we would want them to be empathetic to those whose experience is as yet empirical. So extending empathy is what we do as a business. We publish to let readers imaginatively enter the experience of others, to open ourselves to ideas other than our own, and to widen the world as we find it. I think publishing is more than a mechanism. It's more than a process. It's a mission. Thank you.